Drew, are you recovering from Prosper or what, man? Did you get? <laughs> yeah, man. Every uh, the whole team's still recovering. My voice and my voice is still like hoarse from all the chatter from the conference. Wow. Yeah. Well, I didn't get sick, so I'm gonna say because I didn't get sick, which it's probably because of all the steak I eat. So <laughs> I want to do a shout out to cows out there. Everyone got sick. It was crazy. Like Michael got sick. You got sick. Brian got sick. Devin got sick. Yeah. Like crazy, dude. Yeah. There, there was a legitimate, there was a legitimate COVID outbreak. I don't know if you know, if you heard. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I'm Brian, not gonna Brian sick. I was sick on the first, like I got sick in the first half day. So wherever <laughs> it came from, you know. Oh yeah. Daniel was sick and Eric was sick. Everybody was sick. I, I got to do it. Hold on. I got to knock on wood because I'm the only guy. I don't know. I don't know what happened. It is. It's your carnivore diet that is protecting <laughs> you. You know, it's a shield. Whatever, man. Whatever. Uh, we have an exciting <laughs> episode today because out of uh, this is our today would be our 16th episode on the series. And I would say this is the first one of its kind with John. Yeah. Fang. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I don't know John super well. But yeah. um, what I do know about him is he's a real straight shooter. He's of all the like investment banker people that I do know of. I really like his style. He's real straight. He's a real straight shooter. He understands a lot of the like the technical aspects of what helps get a deal done. He's also very good about like working with sellers at various stages um, to help them kind of understand it. And I, personally, man, I'm like really excited to like talk to him up sort of about like what's going on like there's this terracio thing that's out there there's like yeah. all this discussion about all these aggregators imploding it's like great that's all the new that's all like you know the, the sky is falling news but what is there anything good going on like what is it yeah and as a seller what do the multiples look like what are the like what categories are sellable like what's happening in the market is it soft should you stay away is it radioactive i want to learn all that stuff today yeah right on well, let's do it man okay let's jump in cool all right. Well, hey, welcome. Welcome to the pod, John. I'm excited about having you here. And um, let's uh, let's introduce the audience a little bit about who you are and what you do and how this is a unique episode. Ian, thanks so much. Thanks to you and Drew for having me on. Uh, I really appreciate what you guys do at Bullseye Sellers and, uh, and uh, appreciate the time to get to talk to some of your audience members. So my name is John Fang. Uh, I am a two decade long a career banker, uh, investment banker. I run a firm called Two Roads Advisors. Uh, we are a boutique investment bank. And in the last five years, we've been primarily focused on consumer service and technology deals. And where those deals really intersect is actually in the Amazon and e-commerce spaces. And so in the past uh, 15 months alone, we've had the privilege of working on some 20 plus uh, brand sales, you know, sales of brands that are sold primarily on Amazon or D to C uh, to a variety of investors, buyers, consolidators, uh, even the occasional aggregator. Uh, we merged two aggregators together, helped other players raise capital, sold a couple of Amazon agencies and some tools as well. And so, you know, we have seen some interesting things. We've seen the rise and fall of some of these big aggregators who've raised $14 billion and somehow spent it all in uh, about <laughs> a two year period. Lavish parties. <laughs> Lavish parties. But now we've seen some of them enter uh, you know, a new phase, right? Of of debt consolidation and, and sometimes, as in the case of Thrasio, uh bankruptcy. Uh, and we're seeing new capital being injected into the space. And you know, it's been it's been a fun ride. It's been a heck of a ride. And uh, you know, I'm I'm here to talk a little bit about what we're seeing out there and what uh, 24 looks like uh, you know, for the landscape. Well then let's jump into the landscape. I, I've heard, I remember pre COVID early COVID, it was hot, hot, hot 2021. Everyone was getting crazy valuations. And then now I'm hearing not so hot. What's the truth? Where, where is 2024? So look, I don't envy what we've all been through in the last five years, right? We went through COVID when everyone thought e-commerce was here to stay and physical stores would, would never, uh, rise again. And then we went through, you know, 21, 22 with the supply chain and container costs tripling, quintupling in some cases and, you know, not being able to get enough, uh, you know, supply to, to satisfy the demand. And then we went through an excess inventory in 2023 where everyone had to write down everything. And I think 2024 is finally the year 
where as an owner of a brand, right, that sells on Amazon or e-commerce, things have finally stabilized. Now, Amazon now is creating a new challenge, which is they're increasing their seller fees, which is a whole nother world of pain that we all have to go through. But I think that uh, 24, everyone is sort of seeing as a very optimistic year after being battered, uh, you know, for the last few years. In terms of valuations, you're right. In the beginning uh, of COVID, it was a gold rush. Everyone was looking to deploy capital and these aggregators raised, you know, as I said, $14 billion of capital to go uh, buy up, you know, mom and pop brands. We were doing deals anywhere from let's call it the nine to in some cases, believe it or not, even the 12 times earnings uh, range. Uh, then we saw, it's crazy, right? Can you hold imagine? On, hold on, hold on, hold on. Is that for a brand or, or is that one year in our earnings or is that EBITDA? That's EBITDA, man. Okay. That's what. That's that's for a brand. Yeah, that's we so crazy in, though for a brand. Yeah, in in 2020, we sold uh, a brand that was doing pajamas, you know, adult pajamas uh, on on Amazon, and it was a double digit multiple of their latest EBITDA, their annual EBITDA. Uh, it was uh, it was pretty intense. Yeah, and and you know, if if you want it as an aggregator or an investor, a family office or strategic, if you wanted to break into a category. You were willing to pay whatever was necessary to get into that category. Got it. So if it's a strategic uh, purchase, the value goes up. That's right. And you know, since then things have come down, right? I mean, the, the aggregators got smart. Um, they created formulas where they were basically saying, "Hey, we'll pay anywhere from three and a half to five times EBITDA plus the value of your inventory, and we'll pay you two turns of that EBITDA, so two two fifths of that five times EBITDA purchase price." over a two year period uh, as, as part of an earnout, meaning they tie you to the business and you have to keep running it and hit certain EBITDA targets and certain revenue targets. Wow. And of course, you know, a lot of the owners, they put some pretty aggressive plans out there because they didn't have bankers or advisors advising them. And so they missed their earnouts. And so they were losing out on like 40% of the purchase price that they were promised. And then in some cases when the aggregators went kaput or went into bankruptcy, then the founders didn't get anything because the earnouts were back of the line behind all the lenders who had lent the aggregators all that money. And so, you know, we were seeing owners of brands make some silly rookie mistakes. And while, of course, I'd love to be hired by every brand that's out there, I really do think that, you know, having someone who's gone through this experience uh, is really helpful because as an owner, I mean, how many times are you going to go through this in your lifetime, Ian, as an owner? If you're lucky twice. Right. If you're lucky twice. I have been through 217 of these <laughs> transactions. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I'm not even saying I'm smart about it. I, I, I've just experienced about it. I've just seen it a lot. And you've so seen, you've seen all the ways people can mess it up. Right? I've seen all the ways people can mess it up or yeah. get screwed. And so a lot of it is not just about creating a competitive option for your company, but also just defending you and protecting you against the buy side, which you know they're not running a charity they're not looking to pay you a single dollar more than they than they have to mm -hmm. anyway so the valuations came down dramatically and during the container crisis uh they almost like halved and then in 23 good luck if you manage to even sell a brand we started in 23 looking outside the traditional base of amazon buyers we started talking to brands that were primarily not on amazon and we started telling them look you need to buy this Amazon brand because you have, in some cases, $100, $200 million of products that you're selling in store or through your own Shopify site. But you're missing out on the biggest marketplace and biggest channel in the world by not having an Amazon presence. So why not buy this small brand that's $10 million, $20 million in revenues to get not just that Amazon revenue base, but the expertise from the people who know how to list and manage an Amazon FBA listing? And then you can move your $100, $200 million of revenues from other channels into Amazon. And that was the story we started to tell. And I think that's going to be the story of 2024 and 2025, which is a lot of the guys who are traditionally buying up Amazon brands, the aggregators are impaired. They're hurting. They're in bankruptcy. They're begging for money to, to even survive their own mistakes and travails. But a new class of investors who have seen this growth on Amazon have said, hey, the dust has settled a little bit. Let me get in there and actually pick up a couple of brands who can transform my business and open up what still remains the largest marketplace in the world to my variety of brands that aren't offered. And that story, I think, is the one that's going to be really compelling and resonant in the next 18 to 24 months. That <laughs> coupled with the fact that there's still two and a half trillion dollars of private capital chasing 
private companies out there that hasn't been deployed and the Federal Reserve basically saying we're going to start lowering rates because inflation is, you know, more or less been tackled, you know, starting in June. Lower rates means you can borrow more money to buy up companies, right? More money you can buy, borrow, the higher the price goes. Undeployed capital means there's a supply problem with the number of investment opportunities, but a lot of capital. And so when you add those two things in, we're very optimistic about 2024. Yeah, right. Hey, so I'm just kind of curious, John, we were talking about this when we were at Prosper. <clears throat> you know, Thoracio um, imploded, right, for all intents and purposes. But I actually read their press release. They're doing a restructuring not and they're the big one that people focus on and there's other other aggregators that are on the top 20 list that kind of imploded but that's not the entire viewpoint i think a lot of the seller community they focus on these aggregator implosions but there's other ones that are out there that are healthy and they're and you know maybe they're not just killing it or anything but there's other ones that were strategic they did do things the right way they did plan they were strategic you know all those things what, what are your thoughts on like the state of the aggregator market both you know Probably, I'm actually probably more interested in like what what's going on and like the healthy part of it than I am on focusing on the negative side because we all talk about the negative stuff. Yeah, Drew, I love that question because you're absolutely right. There were groups that were picky through the entire ebb and flow, right? And we're doing deals with those picky groups. They're harder to get through by nature because they're pickier about their acquisitions. But when they say they're going to do a deal, they absolutely adhere to it. And so, for example, last year we sold a skincare brand called CureX to Forum Brands, which is, I think, one of the best run aggregators that are out there. I know the CEO, Ruben, Ruben Amar, really well. He's a great guy. He's got a great team, you know, buying up businesses. Uh, there's another uh, business called Society Brands, who we advise and help them raise a bunch of capital from I-80 uh, a year and a half back. Those guys are killing it too. They're just being very picky about you know, buying specific brands that, you know, cater to their specific niche. Uh, you know, there's, um, there, 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 are, there are so many other groups that are out there that are, that bided their time and didn't kind of rush after acquisitions that are, are still, you know, doing quite well. And I think that's a really great point. Uh, you know, by nature, they're a little bit more cautious, so they're pickier. And if you don't fall within their, you know, purview of the types of verticals that they want to buy in, you know, good luck trying to sell to them. Uh, but if you do, and you're willing to take a fair price, and when I say fair, I mean something higher than, let's say, five times, but lower than, let's say, double digits, right? Then they're great groups to work with. They're efficient, they have the money, and they get Amazon. So I think that's a really great point that you're bringing up, Drew, because there is still, I would say, a third of that $14 billion that was raised in this space that you know did not collapse and is still out there making acquisitions. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Society brands, brandable is one of them. Are there other ones that you think that are like, I don't know, just kind Maybe of interesting best. for sellers to follow, right? Because like for me, I'm just immediately thinking like I need to be paying attention to these aggregators just as much as kind of like all of the talking heads are, you know, showcasing Thoracio and these other ones that are, are that are not doing well. Yeah, I mean, so so for, forum brands, I think is a good one. Um, you know, society, I think is a really good one um you know uh the foundry group uh out in la uh, who we also did a deal with i think is is a really good one um you know the guys who ran uh profound commerce uh which we merged into fba capital which is another basically a merger of two aggregators i think they know what they're doing and they're doing pretty well they're now called uh the amber group a m b r uh group so yeah that's sort of my short list of the yeah. aggregators that are out there that are still doing doing deals and, and still are well capitalized. Yeah, that's great, man. It's great to hear. I mean, the 2.5 million, the 2.5 trillion mark, the interest rates, there's solid aggregators that are out there. The landscape is still for the right sellers. The landscape is still healthy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Amazon's not going anywhere, even though they're trying to squeeze every cent out of our sellers these days <laughs> Yep, with the fee raises. So what about categories? Is there an Amazon category that is generally like just radioactive or no one wants to touch or are there, is, is, is that just a myth? Oh man, this is great. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a myth. I, I look, I, I think, um, I think for the longest time people were, 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 you know, annoyed by, uh, the fitness category. You know, there've been sort of too many me too businesses that had sprung up during, uh, COVID, um, you know, to, to, to cater to that indoor, or self fitness category. And then people were also, 
uh, hating a little bit on the nutraceutical, you know, vitamin category, but a little bit, (laughs) (laughs) a lot of it, a lot of it. Uh, a lot of it, but but I think those two categories have rebounded. I think the guys who've survived have done a good job uh, managing oversized packaging, which has been a challenge on the fitness equipment side, and then also you know managing regulatory risk, which was a big concern on the on the nutraceutical side. So I, I'd say the players that are remaining in those spaces are are really killer companies. Uh, you know I like skincare a lot. Um, we've done a couple of skincare deals right between that QRX deal that I was setting earlier and another deal called Derma Doctor, which was online. Um, if you get a good following on the skincare side, I mean, that's a really, really strong you know, category. We've also done a swift uh, amount of volume, excuse me, on the toy side. Now, toys, I think, are a little bit more subject to the Chinese seller phenomenon, where you get a lot of you know Chinese sellers who come up with counterfeit products and just you know beat the heck out of your 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 product set but if you create a good brand and a good following i think you're actually going to get a lot of love uh from the market you know we transacted um a a bike lights and outdoor balls and toys equipment business uh he's a friend of mine oh yeah craig right so that you know active life that was our client right and we also transacted um uh strictly bricks which was a like a lego competitor uh, as well, and and so you know, we we I think I think the toy space is is less um, dodgy than some some players might think. Uh, I, I like candles a lot as well. I like home decor uh, a lot as well. And so yeah, I think those are the categories that are getting a lot of love. Well, John, I after that I have a few intros to make to you after this call. So I got some. <laughs> I, got, I got I got a great candle client, and uh, we also have some really good skincare clients. So I should make some intros. Sweet. Thank you, Ian. So then how does a brand, if a let, let's say me brand owner has a skincare brand and I'm feeling pretty pumped. I just crossed seven figures and I know I want to exit in the next five years, four years, whatever. What should, like, how do I plan today and not make any stupid moves today that are going to hurt my, my exit in three, four, five years? What, what kind of things should I be thinking with? Yeah. I mean, look, I, I'll, put some basics out there with the caveat that if anyone had told me five years ago uh, about what was going to happen, <laughs> any advice that I would have taken, you know, would have been out the window, right? The key is always about maintaining flexibility and just sort of observing, watching the market and understanding what, where those conditions are. But a couple of things we've seen work. The first is having an understanding of your unit economics. So that means average order value, that means the average cost per sale, right? A cost or tacos as, as, as the parlance goes, understanding your contribution margin, your gross margins on an order by order basis. Cause Amazon doesn't give you customer information. You know, orders are probably the best way for you to, you know, get, get that understanding. I think a second thing is, you know, to the extent that you can create a backup to your supplier, meaning, you know, if you have that one supplier in China or Southeast Asia or India or wherever, have another one just in case that one you know gets into some type of issue whether that's you know covid or some political issue or some import export issue having a backup supplier i think is really key the third is i think growth um you know just having consistent growth even if you can only grow by three or four percent year over year you know going backwards is really a kiss of death when it comes to valuation and you know getting a, a buyer interested uh, in your business. And then I think the last thing is understanding your bottom, bottom line, you know, what people call SDE or seller's discretionary earnings and what we call EBITDA. I mean, it's sort of the same thing. Understanding where that level is at all times, I think is a, a very helpful thing. And and those principles, I think in general, will give you a good sort of uh, understanding um, or a good, good plan to manage your, your brand um, as you prepare for sale. I mean, if you want to go into extra credit or extra innings, Right. I mean, obviously, having good IP protection, trademarks, um, to the extent that your thing, your your product can be patented on a on a design or utility basis, is always helpful. Understanding your ranking within the buy box vis-a-vis your competitors is always helpful. But you know, those things are sort of extra innings. I think the the, the basic stuff that I was saying earlier is probably what you need in terms of table stakes on getting your business prepared to to be sold. Good stuff. I got questions. Good. Um. So. Cool. I'm just trying to, I mean, I am a seller, John, for what it's worth. I'm not in a position to be, to sell my brand. Although anyone's welcome to make an offer at any time. Um, But uh, 
like some sellers are going to be in a in a position to um like sell their business now soon right whatever that is but then there's another tranche of sellers who are like look i see the potential i see things changing in the landscape i'm in a good position to make improvements to my business but for me to do that i need some capital i need some investment is there anything that you guys do that can help support sellers in the preparation of their business what i mean i'm saying capital and investments to help them grow it but like what are the other things that you guys kind of do to either help them and either advisory or actual you know more tactical things financing i don't know relationship management you know building their business etc yeah so that's a great question drew uh look i don't think doing a pre-roadshow roadshow meaning like a pre-tour of buyers before you're ready to sell is a great idea like I, I probably wouldn't take a brand that's not ready to sell and parade them in front of all the you know aggregators that i was saying earlier because there's only one chance to make a first impression and you really want to kind of save that for when you're ready to go but things that i might you know want to do in advance of a brand that actually wants to sell would be things like for example introducing to them to a, a small agency right if the team behind that brand is like one or two people or three people and their core competency is more about product design and sourcing product and sort of managing the listing, then maybe they're not so tactical about, you know, how to kind of defend the buy box and, you know, smack down copycats and do all the stuff that an agency might do. And we've worked with some really great agencies um, that we've sold or raised capital for that work on a contingency basis, meaning they only get paid if they increase the sales of the brand. Mm -hmm. And we've introduced dozens of brands to those agencies and they've actually had a great run where they've helped in some cases those brands grow dramatically and then when they're big enough we're actually ready to sell them so it's a nice little cycle right of of, of reinforcement and growth uh, alongside so I, i'd say that's one thing that you might want to do tactically second thing that you might want to do tactically is seek some working capital financing there are a number of capital providers that are out there that will do factoring financing or inventory financing um which is pretty good to sort of manage your working capital especially if you have a seasonal uh, product. Uh, we will also raise minority or debt capital for companies, but our minimum size, unfortunately, is $5 million. Uh, and so if you're not of a size that, you know, you, you can withstand to take 5 million, I generally like to sort of just make a direct intro to any one of the, you know, sort of specialty lenders uh, or finance groups that um, are in this space. Mm -hmm. uh, that's generally a good thing to have as well. Uh, yeah. And, and, and those two are sort of the biggest levers that I generally find. Uh, and, you know, we've we've got some accountants that you could get introduced to to you know, help your books get prepared. We've got some lawyers on the IP side if you ever wanted to file a patent that we can introduce you guys to as well. But, you know, again, that's sort of extra innings. To me, marketing and buying inventory, right? Financing inventory are like the two most important things. Yeah, we've got right. Some Just the high liquidity side. items. Yeah. Right, right. And we've got some relationships on the sourcing side too. But generally, like if you don't know how to source, you, you know, you're generally not someone who's going to be selling on Amazon, right? <laughs> yeah. What, what's sense. the sweet spot, John? What What makes a brand really sexy to the suitor where it's like, wow, I have options with this brand. I can, I can sell them to th an aggregator. I can go sell them on the private market, whatever. What what aspects really make a brand just other than the obvious of profit, like duh, but other aspects, maybe social media following, um, what other content or things that they could have that really make it sexy? You guys ask the best questions. <laughs> These are very thought provoking questions. Uh, I I think the, on the softer side, right? Like if you're talking not hard numbers, you're talking about like the sex appeal side, right? I think, I think a brand that has appeal um, away from just Amazon, meaning it has its own D2C Shopify powered site, uh, is, 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 a, is, a, is a very powerful. Uh, if you get can get some physical aspect, you know, physical retail aspect of it as well, even more powerful. That brand then becomes omni-channel, as we say in the, in the, in the jargon. But um, you can even cut out the physical part because most of the, the commerce, most commerce these days is, is increasingly online. Just having Amazon in a parallel Shopify store is very, very powerful. Yes, to your comment about a social following. A social following is huge and also yeah. very, very powerful. I think having some brand protection in place, whether in the form of a trademark or a patent, is something that you know a lot of buyers are seeing as more increasingly important if your product is patentable or trademarkable at all. 
Um, Even the, name of the product could be, you know, if you have a cool name for your eyelash, uh, you know, makeup, right? Isn't that a part of that? Like coming up with a great name that people recognize, they search, and it's just a name. Absolutely. Brand equity, right? I mean, that's that's what we're talking about. Absolutely. But Absolutely. there's like kind of two parts there, though, John, that you're talking about. There's like the IP on the product design itself, like, like an invention, right? Like the design or whatever. And then the other one's like the brand itself. And you're talking about both. Yeah, I'm talking about both. I think brand protection is is sort of basic level of importance, right? Every brand that actually wants to be a brand, not just a product, should have some form of trademark or brand protection. I think the next level, which is the level that prevents copycats from knocking off your product and stealing attention in the buy box, is that sort of design patent or utility patent if you can get a type of component. But generally what I see is sellers that are under seven figures don't go after the second part, the, the, the patent part, because it's not worth, the juice ain't worth the squeeze. Mm -hmm. But once you get into seven figures or even eight figures, then that becomes really necessary to protect your brand against those Chinese sellers. Fascinating, yeah. and I think um, if I was a brand owner, these are the questions I would have. I think that's why I have these questions because I put myself in their shoes and I'm like, you know, what, what can I do now? What's cool? What's, what can I do that's, Gonna give me those extra innings, that a little extra sex appeal. That's what I'd be thinking. What are the no-brainer stuff that, that brands goof that you're? I mean, like when you're. Oh yeah, where do they fuck up? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Like, like you know, there's there, there's all the tricky stuff, and I, you know, I don't want to. If ever if, if there's brands out there that've got like little nuanced issues and stuff, I think that's interesting to talk about. But I think for the audience, it's more like, what are the things that like sellers like might be goofing up that they shouldn't because they should have just known better. Like, what is that stuff for them? Uh, it's a great question too. All right, so one that's like so simple, but no one ever thinks about is you as a seller, you think you're doing X in profit, and then you talk to a buyer and you tell them that you're doing X, and then when they actually look at the books, you're doing X minus 30%. That just, that just leaves you open to a retrade, right? I mean, in, in life, everyone sort of takes you you know, at face value of what you're saying. And then when they verify, if there's a discrepancy, it sort of screws up the, the entire trust equation. And that just leaves you, that leaves everything about your business up to sort of debate. So when you don't know your numbers cold and you approach a buyer and the reality is so different from, from what you said your numbers were, that just, that's a credibility erosion thing that happens a lot. Yeah, See, I mean, at a minimum, it's gonna create friction, minimum. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. It happens so much. It's crazy. And it's such a simple thing that, that a seller can solve, right? Just look at your numbers or have an accountant or someone who knows what they're doing to look at the, their numbers. The second thing I see a lot is having a, a unilateral discussion with one buyer, meaning, you know, just sort of falling in love with one buyer because one buyer approached you and smiled at you and said, your business was sexy and I want to buy you. And they throw out a price and you don't basically price check. You, you just go off into the into a room with that one buyer. Well, guess what? All the leverage is in that buyer's hands. He's the one with the money. All you can do is walk away, but you've lost a lot of your time, right? Yeah. And when you're distracted from running the business, it creates all sorts of issues. So try to do it yourself. And also having a unilateral discussion, I think is a really big error that a lot of people make. The third thing I see, uh, I see a lot of people screw up is when they talk about price, they focus too much on the headline price and they don't focus on the components of that headline price. A $10 million offer could be a $3 million cash offer up front and a $7 million offer based off of an earnout, which is to be paid over two or three years. And as we said earlier in this podcast, that earnout could sometimes never materialize. The buyer could go bankrupt. The buyer could run into funding issues. The buyer could claim after he already owns your business that you didn't hurt, hit certain targets. And so focusing too much on the headline price and not focusing on the, the components of that price, I think is a big error that people make. And then when they negotiate earnouts, they oftentimes negotiate them as binary earnouts, meaning it's all or nothing. You hit a million of EBITDA and you get $2 million of payout. But if you miss by a dollar, you get zero. I mean, that's crazy, right? That's who, crazy. Who, who operates like that? But people people negotiate these things. I've seen them. I've, I've had to like, you know, basically unwind and recreate other structures for, for clients. Uh, they also sometimes negotiate earnouts based off of EBITDA instead of revenues. Can you really control EBITDA when someone else owns your company and can run all sorts of costs through it? No, but you can control top line within reason, right? 
And so, yeah, I mean, we see all sorts of these errors, but that all falls into the bucket of how much of the purchase price is paid today versus later, and just focusing on the headline versus the components. So those are three common errors that we see a lot. What about personal costs? Do, do you see that guys are screwing up with, you know, kind of uh, sucking these companies dry and then they're trying to exit and then it shows no profit for the last four years, but the, the revenue keeps going up or do they not really care because they know once they get rid of him, they can have the, the EBITDA that they want. Like it's the, it's the latter. It's the, it's yeah. the latter. Um, Ian, I mean, most buyers are smart enough, um, you know, to, to understand that you can, you can peel back those, those costs. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like, Oh, wow. You really, you really enjoy going out to eat $150,000 a year. <laughs> You must like the Wagyu, man. That's crazy. I saw one seller. I saw one seller who will go unnamed. Please unnamed for this podcast. Okay, no problem. I know you guys have a lot of listeners. His his daughter was a professional or semi professional horse jumping horse jumping equestrian champion, and the stable a horse is apparently a big endeavor. But he ran his entire his daughter's entire horse jumping expenses uh, through the P and L of of his company. I, is that wild? It, I don't even get how that makes sense on the IRS perspective, but okay. <laughs> no, no comment about that. Uh, let's just say, <laughs> let's just say his products, his product has nothing, had nothing to do with horses. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know, yeah, but but, but that's just all table sticks. You know, business. You know, like just understanding business, understanding tax code, and um, not not going too crazy on that regard. So it's 2024. The market is. It is kind of coming back into full swing. Where do you think, um, what about the D2C side? So you said you love the Amazon brands. How much, if, uh, if okay, here's a great question because this is actually a question people I've got have. two great questions too. I just want okay. you to know. You're going to have to wait because this one's good. Okay. <laughs> so if a brand has $5 million revenue on a D2C on their website with half a million dollar EBITDA, and $5 million on their Amazon with half a million dollar EBITDA, which one's worth more? Their D to C and why and how much more? It's all about the buyer that we bring into the mix. If the buyer is an Amazon focused aggregator or investor, the Amazon component of the business will be valued more. I would argue if the buyer is a non Amazon focused uh, business, they would actually value um, still the Amazon component of the business more because they want to enter into the Amazon component, but they would fairly value the DTC component of the business. And then I if thought the other way around, John, I thought DTC would be more valuable since you own your customers and you, you know what I mean? There's more value intrinsically. I hear you. And, and from a data perspective, you're absolutely right, right? Yeah. If you own, if you have a Shopify powered site, you're going to know everything about that customer. You can push, you know, cheaper, you know, email marketing and, and repeat purchases and all of that stuff, right? That we all sort of understand that. But but in from the market's perspective, the Shopify boat has more or less sailed. I mean, people have kind of given up running their own store when you have a nationwide built-in, you know, logistics uh, set center and you run the biggest search engine for e-commerce, you know, in, in North America through the buy box. The, the, the Amazon... Amazon's won the e-commerce game and the capital markets fundamentally understand this. And so unless you're running a crazy hot brand like, uh, I don't know, um, you know, an Allbirds or a Warby Parker or something like yeah. that, um, nobody cares if you own the customer anymore. They just care how cheaply you can acquire that customer and push a box into his or her hands. Wow. I did not expect you to give me that answer. I'm kind of glad you did, though, because it does shape how i think it go ahead it makes, Drew, it makes sense though because you know the the people buying the but buying a seller brand <clears throat> it's bolting on right it's not like it's their only thing so if you can get me a cheaper customer they can then start to use that across their other brands in their portfolio right so it's really just about acquisition costs it's like just like everything we care about is just a seller and i think the data is getting loosened up in uh to be fair like i think amazon well i'm not trying to say that amazon's going to completely release customer names like they were doing in 2011 when they were first starting the marketplace i think there are a lot of tools software tools data mining tools that have gotten so much better about helping sellers identify you know what looks basically like a customer which is 
you know, masked by Amazon, but you know, we're getting better at triangulating the customer. So owning that customer completely as you would through a D2C site no longer has as much intrinsic value if you catch my mm-hmm. drift. I, I catch it because they know Amazon's not going anywhere. They know that that customer is going to come back and keep buying on Amazon. And in a lot of cases, they're going to come off the D2C site and then end up on Amazon. That you got it. Amazon. That's it. That's yeah. it. You just described the, the purchase. Exactly. And that's the big thing with the, So we are... We we did a repeat episode with Jeff Kamadahi. He was on season one and season two, and because uh, he has such a fascinating journey, um, if uh, you're looking at a a big brand to help exit, Justin would be a good guy to get introduce you to. They're doing huge numbers. He told me what, what what's interesting is he's really getting into the big box space now. So I kind of want to know your thoughts on that because he's a successful Amazon brand, um, and I'm talking. Amazon 90%. Like these guys probably do 80 million, 90 million, and uh, you know, 78 of it is Amazon, right? It's crazy. They're now jumping into big box, and that's kind of turning into this full circle situation where people find them in Target and they go to Amazon, find them in Target. So how do you how do you guys work on the valuations when the big box stuff is part of the part of the deal? Yeah, the, the big box stuff is very valuable to big brands that want you know, an, a, a sort of an, a, a, an add-on brand to their portfolio set, right? And so if you have um, physical big brand exposure in addition to Amazon exposure, uh, that to me is the is sort of the, the holy grail construct of, you know, what brand buyers are looking for. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that's gonna be a very, I think it's a, that's a more valuable strategy, candidly, than building your own, D to C site, um, you know, in terms of distribution and getting the brand out there. So I, I think that's very, very valuable. Yeah, Mary Ruth's another good example, right? You, I'm sure you know David Gam and the Mary Ruth sure. team. Yeah. yeah. They're um they 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 went into a really big exclusive deal with Whole Foods. They made they made a deliberate decision to not go to every store. They're like, we we don't want to be in every store in the US. We don't want to be in Walmart. We want to take one partner, Whole Foods. And we want to just give them the best experience possible so that we we fly off the shelves in their stores. And they did that and it happened. It worked. They're flying off the shelves in the stores. And now they're starting to venture into other relationships like maybe Sprouts, et cetera. Um, so that's that's kind of, I think, the next pond. Like if you have a really big brand, you're doing 25, you're doing eight figures or more. I think that's the next pond for you to fish in is to start getting those D2C accounts. Or not D2C, big box accounts. Big box accounts, yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, you got to be careful with big box because Walmart um, has so much market power and will exercise it, <laughs> meaning chargebacks up the wazoo. Um, oh. But, uh, and, and you, you know, it's best to have someone who literally lives in Bentonville and you know, takes a, a category leader out to lunch like every other week. But I mean, if you can get a Walmart relationship going, I you know, you the sky's the limit, right? And the mm-hmm. sky's the what I think is going to be interesting. Sorry to di- di- diverge here, guys, but like, you know, we're riff, we're riffing, so yeah. might as well give you my opinion. I think it's going to be interesting to see how Walmart integrates its marketplace with the brands that it's currently you know carrying on shelf in its physical stores and Target as well, because. From everything, everything I've heard, the Walmart marketplace is, uh, I mean, pardon my French, but a shit show. It's yeah. like the Wild West full of Chinese sellers who don't, you know, obey any rules or regulations and have just sort of created a bit of a toxic environment. Whereas Target, I've heard, is very well curated. The marketplace seems to work a lot better, you know, a lot more targeted. But there's no integration between the online marketplaces they're building to compete with Amazon and the physical stores. But that's their advantage, man. Look at their store footprint. I mean, if you could create some type of really slick integration between your Target or Walmart physical stores and the marketplaces you're building to compete with Amazon, well, hell, that's how you really compete with Seller Central, in my humble opinion. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we work with Walmart. So um, what I will say is it's taken some time, right? Like They did Jet.com back in the early 2000s, and that was their first entree. That was like a couple billion dollar acquisition and it they they shut it down. Yeah, the only guy who made money on that was Mark Laurie. Yeah. So in the reason I highlighted it is that, you know, whatever their whatever their strategy is, it's gonna copy Amazon, where they're gonna outflank Amazon, they're gonna use the assets that they the strategic assets they have available, like these existing brands that they've got in store. 
uh, we're not seeing it, right? As the private label seller that does 10 million in revenue or more per, per, um, per year, you've got to start getting pretty big before Walmart becomes meaningful for you. Yep. For sellers that are in that, you know, one to $5 million per year range, look, we all, we're frequently having conversations with those types of sellers. And the, the discussion always goes like this. Walmart seems like a great opportunity. I read an article. Awesome. Then they look at the setup and the flexibility. It's there on the face value. Then you start looking at like how much it's going to cost for you to manage it, maintain it, service it. Cause you've got to basically have the same operating arm you do for Amazon as you do for Walmart. Also, the return starts looking a little bit less impactful on, as you know, from your, your first impression intuition. So, so it's just, it's not there for many, many sellers. And for the ones that are there to your point, like the Chinese are coming in and just are doing what they do on Amazon, right? They're just trying to undercut and be very, very competitive. But Amazon, I think, has the advantage of, you know, not letting those new sellers, you know, pollute because you, you have a head start. Hmm. Oh, you... I 100% agree with you. Yeah, it's it's even in some instances, it's even worse than to your point, John. It's like it's even worse than what it's like on Amazon. So, yeah, yeah. And Amazon, to its credit, has done a better job policing. Not great, better job, right? So going back to kind of like acquisitions and, you know, brokering and buying and all that stuff. I'm curious about this one question. I don't ever hear this get asked, but if I'm an Amazon seller and I want to create value, uh, what about me doing an acquisition? And do you help me with that? Like, can I combine two nuclei together to create, you know, a, a more sophisticated, um, and, and how does that fit within sort of like the confines of what you do, John? Do you ever see that? I don't even know. Yeah, we do. Uh, look, I'm never of the opinion that you should build your business to be sold. I mean, we're having this conversation about things that you can do to prepare it to be sold, and and I recognize that um, you know that that's what this podcast is more or less about. But at the end of the day, I mean, if you build a nice business, someone's gonna someone's gonna come after it and, and overpay for it, right? And so, I think that um, you know if you wanted to acquire a brand or two to tack on to your existing brands or portfolio of brands that 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 works. Um, I think if you do it in categories that are like crazy disparate, then you're trying to build a mini aggregator. And maybe that's a little bit confusing when you're looking to exit. But let's say, you know, you had, a, you know, a, a, a blanket business for for the home for like a couch blanket, right? And then you, you tacked on a candle business. Mm -hmm. right? That's a very synergistic and kind of, you know, good portfolio, because it's all sort of home related or home decor related. And that's what Judson Morgan, who owned Benevolence LA and Kraft and Kin did. And we sold those two brands in a package deal to Foundry. And it was a great mm -hmm. result. That was, you know, one of those crazy multiple type of deals. And so, yeah, we've seen that happen. We've done that before uh, on behalf of our our clients. And yeah, and that, that's even an interesting nuance too, because I'm taking, I mean, I'm thinking in a very literal sense where like, I'm a fitness equip company, equipment company, like we were talking about before. And there's another brand that sells supplements, fitness supplements, real clear synergy there on face value with what I described. So there's like kind of like two maybe conversations there that if you're in that position, you're interested in selling is like, one is I, I think it'd probably be advantageous for me to go partner with that other one and see if they want to sell. Or the other one is like, you know, potentially doing like an actual transaction and, and purchasing, like if I'm the fitness company, purchase the supplement brand. Yeah. I, totally I've seen agree. supplement brands buy other supplement brands. I actually see that more than any category. So if a supplement brand's in that eight figure, they'll go buy a couple seven figure mm -hmm. brands because they see their rising stars. They don't want to compete with them. They'd rather just buy them. And I do see that. So, um, and uh, we're running out of time, gentlemen. This is uh, this is coming to the close. And the, there's actually been some, uh, some eye-opening uh, for me, some eye-opening things here, John. I, 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 for one, didn't realize the market was actually really back on an upswing, and I'm so happy to hear that. And I think the listeners are going to be happy to hear that because <laughs> no one wants, even if they're not exiting, everyone wants the market to be aggressive. Like, if you own a brand, you want to know that the plan B is always there, even if you don't plan to do the plan B. So that's really good for everyone to hear. Hey, everyone who's listening who still owns a brand that's profitable and growing, I want you to know you've done a great job. You've, you've survived a crazy half decade of ups and downs. And if you're still here and you're still listening to these guys, 
then you've done something right because a lot of people have gone boom and bust. Uh, and, and so if you're still owning a brand and you're still running it and it's profitable and growing in 2024, uh, you know, the, the future looks very bright. Yeah. You've been through the worst of it. Hopefully, hopefully the future, but hopefully, hopefully. Awesome. Well, uh, again, thanks for jumping on. And uh, you and I have uh, you and I should have that meeting because I, I have some intros I want to make for you guys because it seems like you do some really great work. So we should we should have that talk. Yeah, you guys are awesome, uh, Drew. Ian, thanks again for your time. Um, had to come on at any time. Um, I, I have an issue, which is I'm probably the most honest banker <laughs> out there. So sometimes I'll say stuff that like may not res may not be the best thing for someone in my shoes to say, but you know, I can't help myself. I've got to just sort of tell it like it is. And so um, anytime you guys need like a candid take on the market, just uh, hit me up. All right. Yeah, man, for sure. And anybody like, like Ian said, he's got some intros for you, but hands down um, anyone who seems like they're interested that we work with providing an introduction just to get to meet you. You'd welcome that. Yeah, absolutely. Great. John, thanks. Thanks guys. See ya. All, all right. right. Don't hang up yet, John.